Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Kim McGrail, the Director of Research at UBC Health and a professor in the School of Population and Public Health uh, in the Faculty of Medicine. Thanks for joining us today to hear more about the new health equity stream of the Public Scholars Initiative. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that the UBC Vancouver Point Grey campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And the UBC Okanagan campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan Nation. I'd also like to recognize that UBC's activities take place in community and on unceded, ceded, and traditional territories of 203 First Nations and 38 Métis chartered communities, each possessing their own unique traditions and history in the land that we refer to as British Columbia. Today, I'm joining you from the traditional ancestral land ceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to make a few comments about UBC Health and this new health equity initiative. The UBC Health works under the Office of the Vice President Health. We recognize the growing need for collaborations to address complex and interconnected problems facing society. We facilitate collaborations across disciplines, faculties, and campuses, as well as with health partners and communities. Our work enables us to improve the ways we collectively train people, the way we develop knowledge, and how we might shape policy. Our ultimate goal is to address inequities and improve systems that foster and support health. So we're committed to the advancement of interdisciplinary health research and knowledge translation. As part of our commitment, we've partnered with the Public Scholars Initiative within graduate and postdoctoral studies at UBC to facilitate the development of a community of PhD students working to address the complex questions and challenges of our world through collaborations. The new health equity stream is dedicated funding to support scholars who are conducting research to impact health equity within local, national, and global health systems. Today, we'll hear more about the Public Scholars Initiative from Dr. Servulent Turan, coordinator for the program. We'll also hear from a current scholar, Paula Pinzon Hernandez from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the Faculty of Medicine. Paula is engaged in health research and will speak about the value of the program and a health equity stream. Then I'll return to talk more about the health equity stream specifically, and then we'll have lots of time for questions and answers after that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Please welcome Serbulent. Hello. Thank you, Kim, for the nice introduction. Thank you, everybody, for hosting me on your screens. The next coming 10 to 11 minutes that I have here, um, I, I would like to talk very briefly about the PSI. And here's the plan of the talk. We're going to talk a little bit about the PSI. I can honestly talk about it for like three hours until somebody chases me out of the room. So I will try to make it concise, but do feel free to ask any and all questions after. We're going to tell you about how it works, not just from our perspective, of course, from the scholar's perspective also. And then we're going to mention the health equity stream um, about which this meeting is specifically dedicated to. And then the Q&A is going to take most of our time. So um, with that quick um, plan, let me tell you what the PSI is. And this is the only slide I have about the PSI, so I will talk a little bit. It was created about eight years ago in an attempt to reimagine what a PhD is. And the example I always go to, my go-to example, as it were, is the fact that I'm a political scientist. I teach political science at UBC. I have a PhD. Karl Marx, whom some of you may have heard of, also has a PhD. He got his in 1828. And mine besides being, of course, a lot better than his, like mine is, of course, a timeless classic and nobody's ever gonna remember his name, they're identical. They're identical in shape. They're really these thick documents, all written, all of it, introduction chapters and everything, bibliography, lots of references. And we use it to, you know, hit people over the head to prove our expertise on the topic that we wrote about. And it is ridiculous that over the last 200 years since Karl Marx's PhD, the world has changed in every conceivable way, but this highest level of education that we convey on people, we've kind of thought that, yeah, we've settled on the right thing. This is a fine format. This is what we need to do. 
So the PSI comes from an attempt to reimagine what the PhD is. It is not anymore the only one of its kind. There's quite a few other programs. We've talked about this recently in Montreal, and there are four or five different programs of public scholarship in Canada. We, however, are the first. We're the first uh, that broke ground, and we still remain the most comprehensive. The PSI is meant to um, rethink what a PhD is in its process, in its outcome, and the way knowledge is generated throughout the process. Um, I will talk a little bit about all of those things throughout the talk. So far, we have had in our last eight years, we have had 303 public scholars, more than half of whom have already graduated and become doctors, so they're PSI alumni. And uh, in the last eight years, we have put $2.5 million in funding exclusively to scholars' pockets. So this entire funding goes to graduate students who are doing a PhD work. If the PhD work that the scholar is doing is reimagining the PhD in a few different angles, then you might be a very good candidate for the PSI. So I would like to talk very briefly about this because understanding the concept of reimagination is going to inform what sort of things would make a good public scholarship initiative application. So our goals are transformative in nature and in effect, in that the PSI aims to transform the process of the PhD. It aims to transform the world alongside with it. And this isn't an idle um, statement that I made. And it aims to transform scholarship and the discipline from which this scholarship comes from. Effectively, we are eager to encourage PhD projects that create a, and do a purposeful social contribution to public good. If at the end of your PhD, on the day of your defense, you are at the door of your defense room, if your PhD has already changed the world for the better, for a person, for a community, for a group, for a problem, for a larger issue, for society, for, you know, your region or even the world, if you can say, I have already made an impact during my research, this meets into our first goal in that we hope that your work is going to transform society for the positive. We're also very eager to support innovative and collaborative forms of dissertations. Innovative is effectively speaking about the output of it. The point that I made about Karl Marx's dissertation and mine being both like, you know, 300 pages thick writings. Well, you know how many people read Karl Marx's dissertation? That's his least well-known work. Definitely. Because we never really thought that the PhD is meant for public consumption. But it could be. And there is no reason why it wouldn't be. So if you are preparing the knowledge at the PhD level in an academically rigorous way, that you do a very good academic research, but the output of your PhD somehow involves an innovative way, then again, you might be a very good candidate. So innovative ways, as in we have had public scholars who have had um, documentaries as part of their dissertations, podcasts as part of their dissertations, graphic novels um, are being created as we speak as part of their dissertations, websites. Um, so the example here I ask uh, scholars is, how many dissertation chapters do you know of that have won international film festival awards? I know two. Two public scholars have created dissertations and one chapter of their dissertation were in the form of a documentary. And both of those scholars have won awards at international film festivals with their dissertation chapter. If those are the kind of innovative approaches that you have, again, you're a very good candidate for public scholarship. And finally, of course, we value very highly the co-creation of knowledge, the collaborative knowledge, knowledge translation, knowledge exchange, all of those larger umbrellas we put under the title of public scholarship. You do your work in response to an identified problem with a community, an identified problem with an issue, an identified problem with a region, and you do it in collaboration with one or ideally more stakeholders then you are doing a collaborative PhD. And again, that identifies you as a very good candidate for Public Scholars Initiative. Uh, we're also eager to help prepare students for all of the other things that our skill set, our competencies, our research, our solutions are availing us to have. 
Uh, many of us are still being trained for tenure track positions, but there aren't as many tenure track positions as there are graduates of PhDs. So we believe, we know in fact, that if you're working collaboratively with partners, let's say Vancouver Coast, Coastal Health, um, with a solution that they have identified as a major issue, and your work has helped solve the issue or has helped move things forward, you know you have actually created a shape just like you in the world and you have already placed yourself, identified yourself to all the stakeholders as a trustworthy partner who is an expert in this issue. So during your PhD, you're already creating these possibilities for you. Um, and this is one of our goals. So those are the three major goals that we have for public scholars. Let's say you're now thinking, oh, actually, he seems to be talking about me. I'd really love to be a PSI scholar. How do we support you? We support you in three different ways. Uh, we have a very large network right now of 303 scholars. Um, as I said, quite a few of them have already graduated and are everywhere around the world in academia, NGOs, governments, um, their own companies and everything. And we do have about 150 active scholars at UVC and we try to put together as many events as we can to bring them together. We also provide um, professional development, workshops and skills training for all of those scholars. Um, we provide academic support for innovative styles. For example, let's say you're a health researcher who's interested in doing a documentary because that's the example I use, but you don't know how to make a documentary and your committee says, we don't know how to help you with the documentary. You come to us, we put you in touch with all sorts of experts who are going to give you the tools, who are going to give you the expertise, and who might even guide you along the way as you're tr trying to uh, create this documentary from your dissertation. And finally, we have funding. Um, we have funding in two uh, waves. The first one is when you're coming in, you can be funded for up to $10,000. And then the second one is up to $10,000 again, anytime from when you become a public scholar until you graduate. The first funding is almost exclusively in the form of research allowance. We would like to fund you to get the work done, to help you get the work done. The second funding could be in that shape in that you want to do more of the work, or it could be in another shape. You can come to us and say, hey, I have been working with stakeholders for the last five years. I am now in the last year of my dissertation. My funding's run out. Can you maybe help me pay rent and groceries and I can sit down and finish and we will put the money directly into your bank account because we would like to support the public scholars where and when they need the support. So we support public scholars in those three ways. And I can talk a lot more, as I said, I can talk hours and hours, but I have learned over time that it's less appealing to hear from a random dude talking about the program and it's a lot more appealing to hear from a scholar. So uh, I very happily introduce Paula, a public scholar from last year, um, to talk about her experience of the PSI. I will stop sharing so we can see Paula a bit better. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, it's, I'm very happy to be here um, and to talk about my experience in PSI and also to share with you a little bit about my research. So before I tell you a lot of things about who I am and what I've done. I want to share with you a story. And I want to share with you the story of Manuela. In 2018, Manuela was pregnant and had a spontaneous abortion. She lived in El Salvador where abortion laws are very strict and include obstetric emergencies. When Manuela woke up in the hospital, she discovered that she was being prosecuted for homicide after being called by one of her, of her doctors. She was condemned to 30 years in prison and died after two years due to lymphatic cancer. A couple of years ago, the Inter-American Court of Rights ruled in favor of Manuela and called the state of El Salvador to recognize the human right violation of which Manuela was a victim. Why? Because what happened with Manuela was an obstetric emergency, not a voluntary abortion. It was out of care, of care control. Now I want you to imagine what would happen if Manuela wanted an induced abortion or, or if she needed uh, post-abortion care? Well, approximately 97% of unsafe abortions worldwide occur in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, the regions with the most restrictive laws. And of those, only 50% meet the requirements of the World Health Organization. 
this restrictive environment forces people to terminate pregnancies in unsafe environments and put themselves in high risk. Even though the abortion laws uh, map in Latin America has significantly changed, we still need to do a lot of things to help countries mobilize to decriminalize. And there are a couple of things that we can do to face this challenge. But to tell you about what I'm proposing to do, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. So I study philosophy. Um, so among others, I was trained to ask questions, to find gaps. And then I did a master's in public health where I wanted to explore some of the distances between real life experiences of people seeking healthcare and how policymakers create policy. During that time, I had the opportunity to work with the Pan American Health Organization, the Pan American Division of the World Health Organization, specifically with the Latin American Center of Perinatology, that recognizing these regional challenges on abortion care created the MUSA network a network of abortion and post-abortion care uh, providers in Latin America. Working with them, I realized the amount of information, experiences, and knowledges that providers had and could help that could help decision makers not only to make decisions about health policy, but also to support decisions about decriminalization. And I also saw an immense potential of a regional conversation, a kind of a south-to-south -south knowledge collaboration that could help us move as a region to better abortion care. So now back to my research, I partnered with the Musa Network to develop the best possible strategies to close the gaps between people experiencing abortion and post-abortion, healthcare providers and decision makers. And our, our plan is to develop an integrated knowledge translation strategy in which they, the Musa Network as our partners, are part of every step of the process to define and refine ideas that can improve that regional conversation. So what I'm doing right now is uh, reviewing the available experiences of people trying to access abortion care in Latin America. And with that information, I'm gonna go and conduct interviews with expert providers, decision makers, and facilitate strategic meetings um, to discuss the results of those explorations. And finally, our plan is to develop a knowledge translation strategy that will suit best um, the needs of providers and decision makers as knowledge users. And that can also help us create a case study to develop new research. So I'm currently in my second year of the um, PhD. I got into PSI, the Public Scholars Initiative, during my first year. And it was one of those times when you see something that finally fits you. As you may have an idea, I don't have a regular academic profile. And sometimes that can be challenging trying to find um, or apply for funding. So PSI has been the place where I feel it makes sense to think outside of the box, using the knowledge that we gain in the graduate school to refine and think of, think of ideas to improve public health and to be part of interdisciplinary groups of people to think about how to make those ideas happen. Um, that has been my personal experience in PSI. Um, PSI has also provided me with interesting training experiences, the possibility with engaging with other scholars in subjects that I probably wouldn't find in other academic sp sp spaces, at least voluntarily. I've participated in workshops, in translating research into policy, for example, and launches where we discuss how to use alternative communication tools for our research to engage the public. Um, and this, all of this also allows me to question in a good sense my own research and provide, it with, provide me with new knowledge and tools. And finally, Servulent and the PSI also forced me <laughs> to challenge myself to doing a presentation of my research and to record myself probably a thousand times um, until I found the perfect uh, record um, and develop new public speaking skills. So I guess you've heard most about the things that you should consider to apply into PSI, and I will probably only add to really take the time to think how your skills, your experiences, and your knowledge can contribute in a unique way to the conversation uh, of your own research, to your own um, research universe. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, I also would like to mention that um, one of Paula's supervisors, Dr. Sarah Monroe, is a public scholar. She's a public scholar alumna. She was a public scholar in our very first year in 2015. She graduated after doing uh, policy work for the Canadian government, effectively. 
um, that was actually picked up and implemented. And then she became a faculty member here at UBC and she started supervising students. And now we have two of her students in the PSI. So um, we're so very happy to have second generation PSI students right now. Um, just wanted to mention this fact. All right, um, with that said, I would like to share my screen again um, to talk specifically a bit more about the health stream. And for this, I will turn to Kim. Great, thank you, Serviland. And, um, and thank you, Paula, that was a really uh, inspiring uh, overview you gave us. So I'm gonna talk specifically about the health equity stream. Um, and and before we get to the specifics of this, I'm gonna just give you a little bit of background on why we are doing this through UBC Health. Is that, as I um, indicated before, UBC Health is really interested in supporting and encouraging interdisciplinary research. So that's one piece of things. We've um, started some funding programs for um, new interdisciplinary teams, and we've um, had some focus on health equity and also we have one program that is focusing on what we call health and unexpected spaces, meaning well outside of the sort of traditional healthcare system kinds of things. But not, nothing that we've done so far has been directly about supporting student projects. We've always encouraged trainees to be including uh, included in those other um, programs and projects, but this we wanted to do something that really had a, a learner student focus given um, that there's so many health related researchers at UBC and this is a strength of UBC that we can clearly um, be doing better. And this idea of, um, so when we started thinking about that, we realized that the public scholars initiative would be a great partner for this sort of thing because uh, it's a tremendous program, has a um, really, really good reputation among the people who've been in the program, but also external facing. Um, and they have a really well-run system that could be something that we would be able then in a partnership, we'd be able to leverage and then add some um, specific focus for the things that are relevant to UBC Health. So that's kind of the background and, and it's really been such a pleasure to work across the teams to, to build what we're talking about today and really exciting to be here at this point announcing it to all of you. So it um, we do think that this is a, a a unique opportunity for doctoral students at UBC. Um, and we really wanted to use this particular stream to increase the number of people that are working on, on projects that will have an effect on health equity. And I wanna stress again here that we really would value projects that um, expand our thinking about what health equity might be that would include students who may be coming from places that we might not expect a health equity project to arise from. I mean, you could think about health equity coming from forestry, from law, from sociology, of course, from um, faculty of medicine as well, but, but I really wanna emphasize that this is not about healthcare equity, it is about health equity, the broadest way that you want to define that. So we'll be accepting six to eight scholars into the health equity stream. Um, and in, in addition, um, well, and I guess the, the, we'll be using the same adjudication procedures that are used for the rest of the Public Scholars um, Initiative program. So I think you could go to the next slide for me. Thanks. So uh, in addition to the, the programming that kind of that Servulent already described, well, and Paula um, described some of as well, uh, we we will have the opportunity for people to um, engage in learning and networking that's focused on building interdisciplinary connections and a community of doctoral students that are have some common interest clearly co coalescing in, around this idea of health equity. Some of the health equity stream activities will include professional development workshops and they'll be specifically aimed at health research um, such as health equity concepts and terms, uh, clearly social determinants of health and structural determinants of health would be important here. Um, and then we will also have some professional development workshops um, aimed at specific priority research areas. And the, the list that you can see on the slide are example areas that th these will be defined in part by 
the students that are coming in and their particular interests and, and then some ongoing conversations that we're having about what the, the focus might be. So this is just like a um, example list and this might be expanded and, um, and that sort of thing based on based on research interests and, and that sort of thing. Um, Clearly, the, the part of this is about having health equity scholars have the opportunity to network with each other, as well as with other health researchers, academics, professionals, notable guests, and so on. And they'll have the opportunity to be involved in um, collaborations and to have an increasing number of mentors outside of your supervisor committee. And at the end of the year, the plan is to host a public event for health equity scholars to showcase their work. And I guess that means also the ability, as Paula noted, to practice public speaking and to get yet another skill uh, under your belt in this initiative. So I think, I think that's what I needed to say about the specific stream we're talking about here. Um, and that means that we are ready to open it up to any questions that you might have. Um, if you could use, um, you can either raise your hand or put a question uh, into the chat, either one is fine. And um, we're happy to address anything that you wanna ask. Thanks. Uh, we've got a question, are part-time doctoral students eligible? No, um, you're supposed to be a full-time doctoral student uh, when years one to five of your program. We do make exceptions for students in their sixth year. And in the last eight years, we have made one exception for a student in their seventh year. So if you're in your sixth year and you're like, ah, oh, this is just a program for me, I wish I could have done it, but here are the reasons reach out to me, maybe you're one of the exceptions. We can definitely talk about that, but it is for full-time students only. Another question um, is if the individual already holds funding, so for example, try uh, agency, can they apply for PSI? 100%, of course. I, in fact, um, many of our scholars, um, I would like to very briefly kind of expand on this a little bit. In the first few years of the program, as some of you can imagine, maybe from personal experience, uh, we had to face a lot of questions in that, why is this needed? Is the, the thing that the scholars are doing, is that really scholarship? Why do they have to do all of that? Um, and one of the questions that we were often asked is, um, are this really for like brilliant scholars or for like people who are doing second class things? And to kind of answer this, I have asked the awards team where I work, graduate and postdoctoral studies uh, faculty, uh, to run numbers and we realized that uh, PSI scholars have inordinately more amounts of awards than uh, the general population. That means two things. First, it's really the best uh, students kind of end up coming. Second, we didn't know. It doesn't matter to us that you're holding all the awards or none of the awards. It matters to us that your application is a good public scholarship application or not. And uh, so really, can you describe what the application process is like? Wonderful. So the application is going to start, uh, the, it's going to start March 12th uh, to May 13th or March 13th to May 12th, one of those. It's going to run for two months. Uh, our website is going to be updated with all the news and all the information and all the documents in the coming two weeks uh, once we figure things out. So in that two months, you will have time to work on your application. It's a very simple application, two pages. Both page is are limited to 4,000 characters, spaces included. So you very briefly describe your program, what you want to do, and you very briefly describe why this is public scholarship. Then you give us half a page of a budget. Then there comes the references. We expect references from your supervisor or supervisors in many cases. And if you have external stakeholders collaborating with you, they're welcome to send supporting documents also. This is it. It's a very brief application. Uh, by mid-May, you submit it to us. Uh, it goes to a Qualtrics site, and from there it's collected, put together, and then it's evaluated. And then you hear news about it, July, August, at that time. Um, we encourage everybody to apply repeatedly, if you fail, honestly. On average, a public scholar applies 1.8 times before they make it. So that's, that's, I think, a good data to know that on average, an existing public scholar has applied twice. Hi, um, I'm just curious if we apply directly to the health equity stream, um, would are those applicants still considered for the general stream as well? Yes, so 
on the application, you identify your application as a health equity stream application. Those are color coded differently, but they are evaluated within the larger batch of the applications. They're color coded differently because their funding comes from elsewhere. So once we fund six to eight scholars as UBC Health sees fit, uh, the remaining applicants that are color coded as health applicants who still make the cut will still be funded, but their funding is going to come from the main batch. Okay, thank you. We have a question here. Could supervisors pro uh, propose a project and recruit students through the health PSI? It's not yeah. something that we would do, but both Kim and I kind of neglected to mention is UBC Health Street, the, the PSI Health Stream. Uh, we are hoping to run it for uh, three to five years. So it's going to be a learning program. Uh, if there is a tremendous amount of demand, it's something that we could definitely sit down and talk. But otherwise, we are here to support doctoral students rather than supervisor programs. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think at least in this first instance, we're just, we would proceed with the the parameters and application processes that the PSI already has in place. So I think the answer for this round would be not. And so then if an individual has um, an idea for a PSI project and wants to discuss it with someone before starting the application process, who should they reach out to? And Serbulent, I'm assuming that's you. I mean, you're still looking at the PSI manpower. Uh, very hopefully that's gonna change in the coming weeks and months. Um, but yes, um, I am more than happy to sit down and talk. As I mentioned a few times, we do not um, we do not really speak of this idly. We hope to transform the PhD. It doesn't matter tremendously whether you're in the PSI or not. It matters that your work is public scholarship. So do reach out to me. I am more than happy to talk public scholarship with you how to make your work more public scholarship oriented. And if, you know, incidentally, we talk about how to make your application a stronger application for the PSI, I'm happy to help. Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. Just to clarify, I was going through the FAQ for public scholar and it says we have to have a research proposal. So does that mean, do we have to have completed candidacy or can we apply before we complete candidacy? I just wanted you to- You can apply that. right away. You can become a public scholar before you become before you step step foot at UBC. You can become a public scholar in your very first year of the program. Question is, does the PSI cover topics on health workers such as violence against health workers as it relates to health inequity? We have had scholars who worked on violence against health workers. I would encourage you to go to the PSI website and click on meet our scholars. And there you should be able to navigate all scholars per year, per topic, per faculty, per everything. So I would urge you to go uh, meet our scholars and click health as a team, and you will see everybody whose work somehow meets health. And there you will already find scholars who have worked with, for example, nurses in two hospitals in Vancouver uh, on violence prevention programs, how to evaluate, how to make them better, and so on and so forth. So yes, absolutely, we already have funded them. And I would add that from a health equity perspective, I can, I can absolutely see how some projects that r relate to um, health workforce would have a very large equity dimension. So if it fits that, then it would be eligible for the UBC Health Stream as well. Do you accept students that want to work with non-traditional academic track supervisors? I am not sure what is meant by that. We have scholars on whose committee are um, elders from First Nations, uh, chiefs from First Nations, um, stakeholders, we believe, have a, a, a legitimate say uh, about the, the PhD. So we have scholars whose committee members include people who aren't traditional faculty members or faculty members, period. But supervisors, I believe you must be supervised by a UBC faculty member to be a doctoral student. I don't know that an alternative is possible. De de departmental rules still apply. Like I think that's probably the easiest way to answer that. We we can't um, change anything with whatever your home department expects for supervisory committees. Does the PSI support the technology-based ideas for healthy aging? Of course. As long as you, you meet those, the, those criteria that I have identified, if your work is hoping, uh, has a legitimate claim, that it's changing the world for the better in some small way, in some medium way, in some large way, 100%, nobody's going to be like, yeah, but technology, no, like, of course, 100%, yeah. Uh, do you have to have existing work with a collaborator or can it be in progress or reaching out at the at right now? 
So that's a good question. No, you don't have to have an existing work with a collaborator. You absolutely don't. That being said, and the collaborator's letter of support does carry weight. And we have seen applications where the collaborator, it's like um, it's half a page of a letter that says, this person is one of our family now. We've been working with them for 15 years. We trust them implicitly. And that's all we need to hear, that the scholar's work is not only finding purchase with the stakeholders, but that it has a demand that the stakeholders implicitly trust the scholar and their work is going to have a place to live. And we've had letters where like, yes, the scholar has approached me and I am interested in hearing more, which effectively means you've just reached out to them a month ago and they're like, yeah, why not? Let's talk about this. You can imagine the weight that those two letters have is different for, the, for an adjudication committee. So you don't have to have an existing collaborator, but you, if you're hoping to have a collaborator, it helps that they know who you are it helps that your work is needed for them and then they can speak to that fact. Does the PSI support projects on clinical populations um, like um, Parkinsonians? Yes, absolutely, of course. As I said, it's um, if your work is addressing an issue, even that person, um, absolutely. We've supported quite a few issues. Again, for all the examples, I would urge you to go to the website and um, I can, in fact, I can, if that's okay, I would like to just show it to you very quickly. This is the website. So you go to the PSI, you will see a different cohort, all of you. So don't worry if that's not the picture that you have. And if you say meet our scholars, you're going to see everybody. And here you can say, team, give me people from health. And then you will be able to see everybody's work. Um, we have, honestly, just take a look at it and you can just click at any student and you're going to see this profile that, that describes their work. If they have a video available of their talk, many scholars are going to have it, many scholars, not all yet, but many scholars. And then you can effectively see their issues. So this is Jennifer's work, for example, is working with a First Nations BC community that have identified preterm birth rate in their communities higher and they were looking for help and um, research help and um, Jennifer was among the students that have helped. So I tried to. So I would urge you to go and check out for all of these specific questions. I bet that after eight years you would definitely get a very good sense of what are the the, the supporting things. I have I, I want to underline one last time what Kim said in that the idea is to expand in that it's not healthcare equity, but health equity. So all of these are absolutely contributing to health equity and we're more than happy receiving applications on those issues. Um, when submitting the application for funding to support the research, how granular or precise does it need to be? Uh, okay, that's actually a really good question. So we have two levels uh, in the adjudication process. We don't ask the adjudicators to evaluate your budget because it's not their expertise. Um, the adjudicator is going to know whether your research is meeting the criteria, so they would know about public scholarship. At least one of the adjudicators will be very close to an expert on what you're proposing. We have enough of a pool that we will know to be able to assign your application to somebody who would understand exactly what you're talking about, whether you're missing any big developments or something. Um, so that's what it's going to be evaluated on. But those experts do not have the expertise on putting budget together, expenses, and so on and so forth. Once we have a ranking, at that point, a smaller committee starts looking at the budgets. And it's like you're asking for $10,000. It's surprising how many people that ask for exactly $10,000. It's like, oh, it just adds up to $10,000. What an unbelievable coincidence. Um, so it is a lot wiser in my personal experience to ask for $9,167, because that's exactly what you need and you know exactly where this is going, than a rounded up 10,000. Because it projects to the adjudication committee that you have mentalized the process, you know what you're talking about, you have planned things thoroughly. We know it will change. 100% projects change. Of course, you hit the ground, things happen, you're working with stakeholders, Things change, we know it will change, but it shows strength of application when you know exactly what you're looking for, rather than like, 
5,000, I want to go and live there for a while. 5,000, I need to eat too. Like it's, that's not a good budget. And it doesn't, it doesn't project strength or, or thought put into it. Okay, we have uh, answered all the questions. I will just um, close by saying thank you to Serbulent and to Paulo um, for participating uh, in your all of your time and to all of you for joining us today to learn more about what we think is this really exciting opportunity. Um, as I said one more time, we, we know that health um, equity oriented research is happening all across campus. So if, if this appeals to you, then at the very least follow up and have a conversation to see if the, the topic that you're wanting to proceed fits. But as you, as you heard from Servulent, lots of things fit into the into the PSI. And it really is about sort of shaking up the traditional outputs more than it is, um, and, the, and the process more than it is about the specific topic being um, so different from, from what other PhD students are doing. So there will be additional information about the call for applications on the UBC Health website. Um, and um, we will send an email to everyone who registered for this session. I also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. And with that, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see more of you another time. Thanks. <laughs>